Um, yeah, so um, in case not everyone had seen the syllabus and the announcement that I had sent a couple, like over the weekend, I figured maybe we should start there. Uh, then I'll tell you a little bit about the course, like what we're supposed to do here in linear algebra. And yeah, depending on how much time uh, we have left, um, we'll begin covering some material. But um, let me begin by sharing my screen. Ah, here it is. So yeah, let's begin with the syllabus just in case. Uh, so for like for the office hours, my plan was usually to just have them um, after the class. So my idea was like, I'll just typically record the lectures. Uh, so once we're uh, finishing with the class, I'll quickly just close the Zoom meeting so that the video gets saved to my computer. And then I will just reopen the Zoom, the Zoom meeting for uh, in case anyone wants to ask me something for like, you know, the, for office hours. Uh, but yeah, in, if they work for some reason, then you can just email me if you have any questions or anything like that. But yeah, usually uh, my plan was to have like the office hours after class or even before we start class. If you have any questions, too, you can also ask me about that. Um, so um, there's this textbook for the course, which is like the official one, um, which is the one that you see here. But like in reality, that's like, you know, kind of like, you know, purchasing this book is optional. So you don't have to do it if you don't want to. Uh, I also have post, like I posted another reference uh, reference on the Canvas side. Uh, either of those would be fine. Like the advantage of the Canvas one is that you don't have to pay for anything. So you don't need to take, it has a textbook. Um, like there's nothing specific like you know at the end of every class i'll let you know of the materials we cover what uh, to which sections of the book it roughly corresponds to but you know there are alternatives and so um if you just check for example the one that i like um the one that's on the canvas side that would also be useful so but i mean since um it's the official textbook i, I figure i should just bring it on um or, or should just mention it. And then, um, yeah, in terms of how um, the class was being structured. So usually I think um, we'll have like, well, depending on the week, you know, one or two quizzes. I'll do those like at the end of class, uh, typically during the last 30 minutes. Like the quizzes is mostly for you to get used to like the proctoring of the exams. So since the class is online, the exams are online as well. So we'll use um, lockdown browser and responders for taking the exams. So I'll have the quiz like in the same setup so that you just get used to that. Um, but usually what I like prefer to do for the quizzes is kind of like give you like a list of problems to study for each quiz. And then I just like will uh, pick the quiz problems from that list that I gave you. So it's more like, it is more like a, some sort of like um, way to make you practice a certain number of problems each, each week. But um, but yeah, like uh, the, everything, like the quizzes and the exams will be take place during class um, using um, this responder, responders lockdown browser thing. So be, like officially our first quiz is on Thursday. So what I'll do, before Thursday is kind of create like a fake quiz, which won't be worth anything, but just for you to enter and try responders to see if it's working for you. Um, not everyone may have used it before, so it's just to get used to it. Um, is that okay? I don't know if there are any questions about this so far so good. Uh, Yeah, on the modules, oh, like here you can see like some of the stuff I have posted. So, right, these are like the references that I was referring to. But um, I also have, I mean, that's also another reason why you don't have to 
of like an official like a copy of the book I, I like you know over time I have created like a list of problems for the course as a single pdf I find it easier so whenever like usually if I want you to study a particular problem for the quiz or for the exam I'll just uh, refer to list, this list of problems um, so I'll be like oh just work out these problems these problems etc so um, of course if you want to do more problems that's that's fine but um, in a sense, like, you know, there's the, the thing about this uh, linear algebra course is that there's not that many variations in the type. I mean, like the funny thing about linear algebra, it's very different from other courses in the sense that um, almost every problem in linear algebra can be solved by reducing a matrix. Um, and you'll see what that, what that means in a couple of lectures. Uh, it's just like there are many, you know, there are many variations of how how to, um, you know, to to get to the uh, process of reducing the matrix. But in terms of skills, like um, the funny thing about linear algebra is that most of the skills are like um, very like um, elementary in the sense that they use like multiplication, arithmetic uh, operations of that sort. But somehow. Um, you do them many, 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 many times. And that's kind of what, uh, you know, where the interesting things start to occur. But there's, it is not like, if you have taken like a calculus um, course, it's not like a calculus course where you just learn tons of different techniques. And then the problems are kind of like figuring out which technique to use. Like in linear algebra, many of the tools are just like the same they just get applied over and over and over and over. So that's good and not, I mean, that's good if, if you get used to how to um, learn that the main tool. Um, but so it's not like, uh, you know, it, it's just different because like sometimes like the, the number of problems that you need to do is in the sense like less than what you typically would have to do in calculus. Because in calculus, again, like if you have taken calculus, when you're trying to find a derivative, it is very convenient to like, you know, find the derivative of 20 or 30 different functions. In linear algebra, when you're trying to reduce a matrix, which again, we'll, it's kind of, we'll learn about that. You know, once you reduce, know how to reduce five or, if once you reduce a matrix five or six times, you kind of get like the idea, almost everything won't, like there won't be surprises in the same way in which there are surprises like in calculus when you're taking finding derivatives or finding integrals. So that's kind of like an advantage um, of linear algebra compared to say, like calculus. Uh, and the other thing I was going to say um, before we begin, yeah, I had both, again, these are not real assignments, but it's just like useful um, where like the first one is just, if you want to give like an introduction of yourself, um, that's more for everyone to see in the class um, so it's kind of more like, uh, maybe since like, especially the course is, uh, online for you to kind of get to know one another. The second one is more like for me, like, uh, I can show you what the questions were. I mean, just like to give me some sense of what your back, uh, you know, what courses you have taken, um, what sort of math things, you know, uh, things like that. So again, they're optional, you don't have to complete them, but it's kind of useful just for me to, to have a better idea um, of uh, where you are taking the course, um, et cetera. Is that making sense? Uh, any questions about this so far? So good. Okay, so let me just um, try to tell you a little bit about um, what the course is about. I'm just waiting for the, okay, here it is. Uh, so, um, linear algebra is mostly about two different things. 
I will also share the notes um, after class. So I mean, it can be convenient to take notes. I, I find it useful, but if you also don't want to take notes, that's fine. I'll, usually at the end of the class, I'll just upload whatever I wrote to the Canvas site. So linear algebra, uh, there are two pillars or two main um, uh, objects that we study in linear algebra. So one uh, is uh, the concept of a vector. And the other is the concept of a matrix. So linear algebra is really vectors and matrices. Those are the only two things we'll study in the course. And uh, so there are two, these, these two objects, of vectors and matrices, and linear algebra is basically about how they interact. Okay. So um, I like probably like the first one. Um, vectors, it may be more familiar if you have taken like a physics class before. Um, but if even if you haven't, that's fine. I'll, let, I'll start right now by giving you like a brief introduction of what vectors are and over time we'll learn more properties about them. So let's begin with vectors. Um, by the way, if you, like, you know, if you have any questions, you can always mute, unmute yourself if you want to ask it, or I'll also be checking the chat uh, regularly, but. Uh, okay, so again, like they're very, they're different concrete way, they're different ways to think about vectors, but in linear, in this course, um, there's a very specific one. So, here, here's an easy way to begin with this. So, typically, you know, in high school geometry or even before that, then you will learn about like the Cartesian plane, right? Like the XY plane, and you will draw like a point, um, like a point on the plane, right? So, that's, that's fine, right? Uh, So like this point, uh, you know, it's kind of something that has no size, you know, it's just like one, a dot that you draw on the plane somewhere, right? But uh, the, like one uh, first approximation to think about a vector, right? Is that on the Cartesian plane, there's always like a, pre, like, you know, a special point, which is the origin. That's kind of like the most important point on the plane. You know, almost so, almost pictorially, you can imagine that, like, you know, um, on on this point on the plane, you have like a uh, radar tower or something where you're keeping track of all the other points. So you could have like a laser, laser point pointer, and from the top, from the origin of the tower, right from zero zero, you would point to the uh, to this other point that I drew for you. So you could create like an arrow, right? An arrow that starts at the origin and in this case ends at the point one, two, right? So this is an arrow. Is that making sense? And so that, um, this arrow is the sort of thing that we will refer to, at least for now, this arrow is the sort of thing we'll refer to by vector. So for us, that this uh, is what we mean by a vector.
Is that making sense? Uh, so far, so good. Uh, so for us, like a vector, um, in from the, in this way of thinking about it, a vector is an arrow that kind of connects the origin to some random point on the plane. So like a vector is like an arrow from the origin to some point on the plane. Okay, uh, like, you know, if you take other courses, like a physics course or even multivariable calculus course, like they would tell you, you know, um, you know, if you have this vector, right, you can kind of make a clone of it, right? So what, and you could transport it, right? So let me see if I, I'll er erase this in a moment, but like just to give you like an idea. So I think I could actually copy paste it here. So we like that's the advantages of like um, you know, let me copy paste it. Oops. So like here, like um, you see, like if I what I did with this arrow was kind of like move it around. Uh, maybe I should just I'll just draw it here actually. Hopefully, it looks similar of the same size, right? So what I did with the arrow was kind of take it, copy it, and just drag it uh, somewhere else, put it somewhere else on the plane. So like in a sense, like those two vectors are considered the same. So like you, you should think of the vector really like as some arrow that's somewhere in space. It's just that for linear algebra, it's convenient to just always make them start at the origin. So that's the way we will think about it about them in this course. But in other courses, you kind of want the arrows to be drawn all over the place, not just like beginning at the origin. So let me just let me just say that in other courses, uh, or in other di places, disciplines, whatever, it's useful. It is also useful for these arrows uh, to begin points which are not the origin. But uh, for us, uh, the most useful thing, is the easiest thing is to make them always start at the origin. Uh, in linear algebra, we will always start them at the origin. Okay, so again, like in in other places, this would also be a, a vector and in a sense, it's the same vector as this one because they have the same length, right? If, if you thought about these two arrows, they have the same length and they're kind of also pointing in the same direction. I mean, they're parallel, right? Um, and that's fine. It's just that for us, kind of all the vectors will always start um, at the origin, so. And this is also like, again, um, if you take like a physics class, this would be where like a physicist would call like a position vector because it is literally giving you the position of a point, right? If you think about this point, a vector is, or this arrow is telling you, uh, it's locating this point, this specific point. So that's why it also makes, makes sense to call it position vector. And that's why they would like give, call that vector R instead of the name they give for position is R instead of B. 
but for um, because they reserve d for velocity, but for us, like uh, just like uh, some notation or te terminology, just to make it kind of useful to know. For us, I'll always put like an arrow when I'm referring to a vector, so I'll use always an arrow. And the common letters for vectors are like UV and W. That's the kind of like the three that get used most of the time. So I'll typically I've started with V or vector. And then if I need more vectors, I'll move to U and W if necessary if needed. Um, that depends more on the circumstances, but that's kind of like how they are written as well. Is that making sense? So again, uh, the vectors, uh, one of the nice things about vectors, um, if you think about it, uh, like, if you start with a point, then again, like a point is literally like a dot, right? It has no size, it has nothing. But if you think of the vector, like, you know, associated to this point, it has a length, right? And it also has a, a direction, it's pointing somewhere. So that's like the other way you, you usually introduce the vectors. Vectors are things that have le a length or size and a direction. So that's another way to think about vectors, which is essentially what an arrow is. So that's like a, a, a nice way to think about them. Uh, and just as a, another convention, I mean, um, like in this course, like usually when you write a point, uh, you like, if you think, think about it, like when you are entering the, you write a point like one comma two, like you write the entries typically horizontally, right? Uh, in linear algebra, it's more convenient to write the entries vertically. So let me just give you like an, an, an extra notation. So extra notation. If I write something like B equals one, two, right? By that, I just mean a vector. It, it is a vector because I'm putting like, uh, you know, an arrow on top of it. So I'm trying to emphasize that it's a vector, but I'm notice like that the only difference between um, the, the how typically you would write a point is and now I'm, I'm kind of enter, entering the entries vertically. Um, so if I write something like this, I mean, this means the vector that starts at the origin and finishes at the point one comma two. This means the vector which starts at the origin and ends at uh, one, two. So for example, I could have another vector just to emphasize that we could have other vectors. So I could put like, let's say negative one, three, or yeah, um, yeah, why not? And it would be mean very uh, basically the same. So one, two is here. All right, so here is like the point one, two. And then here's the point negative one, three. Uh,
and then there would be those two vectors. So like what I'm trying to say is that kind of like to, to identify a vector is more or less essentially the same as identifying a point because the moment you have a point, you kind of just draw the arrow from the origin to that point. So there's almost like no, like in that sense, like in the way in which you can, uh, this is what you would call like writing a vector in terms of its entries. When you write a vector in terms of, it, of its entries, it's more or less the same as what you would do when you write a point in, ter in terms of its coordinates. Essentially, there's almost no dis distinction because of the, the advantage that we made or the convention that we made at the beginning that the vectors always started at the origin. So this is all like in a sense, not ambiguous, you see? But the only kind of like difference like is that um, like I'm writing the vectors like vertically um, instead of horizontally, like that's not a big thing at the moment, but it will be convenient later on for certain, even maybe today, for certain formulas, it just gives you some sl slight advantage if you always write the vectors like vertically. Okay. Uh, I mean, that will be called a column vector uh, later on, but for now you can just think about it like as being written vertically. Is, is that okay? So again, like there's almost no way to get, um, com Hopefully, there's very little chance of um, confusion because, like, if you really mean the arrow, you put like an arrow literally next to next to the notation, so on top of the of the letter. So that will always re remind you that uh, you're thinking about it as a as a vector. I mean, like um textbooks, like what they would do on textbooks, like it's kind of tedious to write arrows. So they what they would do is put them in bold letter. So what you'll see um, on, on textbooks is like the vectors being written in bold letters. Maybe I should also write that as well. It's just that, like, you know, on the iPad or on the on a, on a board, chalkboard, it's very complicated to write something in bold. So it's that's what the only reason. And also, it's less uh, geometric. It's very tedious to use arrows when you're typing on the computer. Is that making sense? So, um, and now, when once you have vectors, um, what what's next? It's like you know, you sh you have you should think in a sense like the vectors are some sort of like a generalization of numbers. Okay, so vectors are also like a way to generalize numbers. So when you have numbers, um, what are things that you could do with numbers? Like for example, you could add numbers together, right? And get a new number, or you could also multiply numbers and get a new uh, number. So there's kind of like analogs of that for vectors. Um, the first thing you could do is like multiply a vector by a number, okay? So like this is, you can think about it as the first vector operation. So here's vector operation one. A vector by a number. And in this case, it's kind of easier, better to think about it ge more geometrically at first. So let's say if you had a vector, 
Um, oops, let's go. So I have a vector V, right? And now I just want to try to define what I would like to mean by, and in fact, let me, like we, we can put them um, in a couple of minutes on the XY plane. But just think that you have like a, a, an arrow in space, uh, which is called is this vector V. Uh, and you would like to try to define what you mean by the vector two V, okay? So this is like the number two times a vector V. Okay, so that convention or like what ends up being useful to do is to say, well, we're going to take this vector to be twice as long. This is going to be a vector that's twice as long and pointing in the same direction as B. So it would look like what? Something like this. So, so this is twice as long and in the same direction. Is that making sense? But then what you can do next, uh, so that's what, um, in terms of a picture, it means like you're just doubling the vector essentially. Uh, you could like just think about it in terms of the entries. So for example, just to make it more concrete, like if you have the vector V, so let's say that the vector V is this one in the sense that it finishes at the point X, Y, right? Let's say that the vector V finishes at the point X, Y. Like, so now we're saying that two V is kind of like the same vector, but just twice as long, right? So you see it here, like eh, what, what, what's the point where 2v should, should end? The, the starting point is always zero, right? For all the vectors. So what should the ending point for the vector 2v be? What should the first entry be? And what should the second entry be? Any guesses? Yeah, it just, perfect, excellent. Yeah, that's why it's uh, defined this way. So if you, it's literally just saying two X to Y. So it's just literally multiplying the entries of, of the point by the number two. That's why it, it is a convenient way to define it because you almost have to think nothing, you know, like you just multiply it. So, uh, so that, uh, you know, you can do it, you can check like, it's essentially like a, um, that's, um, basically like, you can check like, you know, you could compute the length. You can, comp like if you really weren't unsure, like the thing is that you can compute the, this length using Pythagoras theorem, right? Because there's like a right triangle here. We'll do that later, but there's like a right triangle here. So you can compute this length using Pythagoras. And then you can compute this other length using Pythagoras. And you say, you see like in Pythagoras theorem, you have to square the entries. So you get like a four, but then you take the square root of that. So uh, the four comes as a two, comes out as a two. And that's why the length just get multiplied by two, you see? So, but again, I will talk about the length of a vector later on. Right now, I'm not too interested in finding the length, but like, you know, if you were unsure, that's how you could do that. And then like almost by the same idea, like you can just check that the angle has to be the same if you just um, multiply um, every entry by the same amount, okay? And then just based on that, right, uh, what would be, for example, 
what would you, what do you think would happen if you wrote the vector like let's say negative one half of v okay so what should the effect of the minus sign be here what do you think would happen yeah it just flips the direction exactly and because of the one half that's like 0.5 right so it would shrink the length by a factor of one half right or by a factor of two so like kind of here let's i'm trying to make this half as as big as the original one So yeah, this vector is um, half as big, but the most more important thing is that uh, you reverse the direction. Perfect, yeah. So because of the minus sign, right? So minus sign Is that, is that making sense? So uh, again, uh, doing the operation, like this actually is kind of like the easiest operation. So multiplying a vector by a number, it is not like, um, you know, too different from like doing two ordinary multiplications, right? Because you're just like multiplying every co each corresponding entry by the number you care about, right? So when it's 2v, multiply each entry by two, and when it's minus one half v, multiply every entry by negative one half. So it's just like re it's just ordinary multiplication by doing it multiple times. Okay. Like later on, we'll like our vectors may have more than two entries. Like that's where linear algebra becomes uh, useful, where like the vectors end up having like three or four or five or six or seven entries. But it is the same principle. So if you had like a vector with ten entries and you multiply that by two, that means every single entry gets multiplied by two. So it's kind of like the same principle. It's just like, uh, obviously there, you cannot really visualize it in the same way as, as now, but in terms of like the algebra, the operations is essentially the same, the same idea. Okay. And um, the other one that's uh, convenient to, like the other operation, um, before we move to the like really interesting one. So the other operation that's important to keep uh, in mind is like the operation of adding vectors. So the second operation is how to add vectors. Which this is maybe uh, less intuitive. Um, I mean, there could be like a couple of things uh, you could think of, but um, again, let me draw it like um, before the X, Y, before putting them on the X, Y plane, and then I'll put them on the X, Y plane. But the idea, if you had like a vector V and you had like a vector U, let's put the vector U here. Uh, like to wait, the way to define the vectors is, um, I mean, there are, again, different ways to do it. Uh, one way to do it is like using what's called the parallelogram law. This is how you would like add forces, like if you have taken a physics class. So essentially the point is that you can think of like, you know, making clones of each vector. So you make a clone of the vector V and you make a clone of the vector U in such a way that you kind of 
and the forming a parallelogram like you see here. Okay. And then uh, the, the u plus v, the vector u plus v, you just take that to be the diagonal, this diagonal that you see here. Oops. So the sum of vectors is just, so the important thing here to realize is that the sum of vectors is a new vector. So the u plus b is like, u plus b is a new vector. By the way, that's the same, it's going to be the same as v plus u, which may not have been, like maybe you were unsure about that, but it is the same as v plus u. That's going to be a new vector. Uh, which corresponds to one of the diagonals of the parallelogram. Uh, okay, which starts, um, which is, basically is the one that starts where both, since for us the vectors always start at the origin, right? Uh, all of them is, are starting at zero, zero. So it's just like the diagonal that ends where like, um, you know, the, like that kind of um, already kind of fixes everything else because it's just uh, it starts at the same spot at USB. Okay. So like now it's time to put it on the on the XY plane. So the what I'm trying to say is that um like here you could have like the vector V. Let's say that it end, ends at the entry at the point where entries are x1, x, x1, x, y1. And here you have the vector u. And u ends at the point with entries x2, y2. So literally, uh, the way in which um, u plus v is defined, actually, The way, in, if you were to check how the uh, the point where the u plus v is going to end, it actually corresponds to the point that you get by adding the entries correspond uh, the corresponding entries. So u plus v does end at the point whose entries are x one plus x two and y one plus y two. I mean, in a sense, that's how the addition is defined. So that that would happen basically. So again, this is like, a, let me just um, give you some examples. So for example, if V had been like one, two, and U had been like, let's see. Um, oh, that's nice. let's make V larger actually. If V had been like um, three, one, just to make it more realistic and you had been like one, two, then U plus V is literally what you get, would have been what you get by adding the corresponding entries. So the, um, the first two entries, like, or the top entries add to four, right? So you would put four here and the bottom entries add to three. So you would put a three here. So these would correspond to the point four, three. Is that making sense?
Are there any questions about this so far so good? Okay, so like, again, just so far, like if you have a vector multiplied by a number, each entry gets multiplied by that number. And if you have two vectors and you want to add them, each and like the, you add the corresponding entries, but here you have to make sure that they are added at the, at the same height, right? So the, the top entries are added, the bottom entries are added, right? And if the vector had like three entries, like the top entries get added, the middle entries get added together and the bottom entries get added together. So you never like kind of combine like the entries from different heights. It's always like at the same level, the addition takes place, okay? But if you, uh, if you just take care of that, I mean, as long as you're careful about that, the addition is no more complicated than like, the regular addition of numbers. It's just that now you have to do it more times because the vectors have more entries, right? Is that okay? So far, questions about this? So, uh, up to now, like what we have been doing is very elementary, just in the sense that like we're just redoing like things with numbers that you knew how to do before, right? So nothing really too interesting has happened at the moment. Where things become more interesting is when you think about other things you can do with a vector with, you know, besides adding them or, mul or multiplying them by a number. So that's what I'm about to do next. Uh, it is a slightly different topic. Um, so let's take like a five minute break. If anyone wants to grab some coffee or just go to the bathroom, whatever. And once in five minutes, like we meet again and I'll tell you the next operation because that one is um, a lot more interesting. And that's where like really linear algebra starts like showing um, its true colors. So let's meet like, yeah, in five minutes, I'll, I'll just mute, pause the recording and in five minutes, I'll tell you what that is. Uh, new new operation is. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll um I'll send you a video once um uh, the class. Well, a couple of minutes after the class is over. Yes. Let's see. So um. Uh, upper, like the, the thing that's like a lot more interesting that you can do is something like the, like the following operation. And again, this is where the, this uh, starts becoming useful. So the thing, another thing you could do with a vector is rotate it, okay? So what do we mean by that? Like it is literally what you are going to say here. So I have a, like, think of that this pen as a vector, right? Because the vector has like a length and a direction and a rotation would just do this, right? So a rotation is literally what you would think of as a rotation, right? Like you're just moving, going to move the vector uh, around by some angle. So just to make this uh, more clear, right? Let me put it, um, let, let's say that the vector you start with is the, this one, um, V, okay? And I'm going to rotate it by some angle, theta. I mean, this is a new vector, so let me call it V sub R. The R here stands for rotation, so this just means like like the rotated version of V, right? Like the R here is for rotation. And I did a rotation that's like, cut, like usually like the way, like the convention is kind of opposite as 
like you know, as the one on watch it, um, watch it, like because like the rotation is counterclockwise. So, but that's like the more common convention in like physics and mathematics. So, so like what I what I'm doing here is rotating V counterclockwise by an angle of theta to get V R. So here, what I'm I'm doing is rotate rotating V counterclockwise. angle of theta to get to be r. Is that making sense? Uh, well, maybe I should ask first, is the, is the problem making sense like what you would do, uh, like what, what I'm trying to do physically? I'm taking like an arrow and rotating it uh, by some angle. And this is literally like the formula that we're about to find is kind of like the baby version of the formulas that you know that you would use like in computer graphics if you have like a video game and you have like link running around and you have like the camera angle rotating like its perspective. This is like how things get done, right? This is like everywhere, like in computer graphics, the rotation or like uh, you're flying an airplane and you have like a you know like a simulation of like how. <laughs> Everything that involves like uh, rotating like uh, the an object will use like a version of this formula. So this is like how the the uh, everything yeah that involve like it just has like a, a tremendous number of applications. Um, like even when you like you know where like on your iPhone like you know how it rotates like a picture on the phone when you ask it to rotate it. All of, all of this goes through this formula, okay? So, so yeah, the goal is to find like a formula for, for this, okay? Oops, let me, so what do we mean by, oops, let's see. Let me copy paste this. So how can you find like a formula? Well, uh, you can imagine that, like here you have to imagine that V is the input. So think of V as, like again, if you want to think about it like in, in terms of a computer, like V is the input and VR is like the output, right? So you start with V and you want to produce VR, right? So in a sense, you kind of have to think of V as, as data that you know, right? It's a vector that you know. You're just trying to find a new vector VR. So think of this vector as having entries X, Y, right? So in a, like they look, X and Y look like unknowns, but they're not really unknowns because that's kind of like what you would be feeding to the computer program, right? So they're like, that's kind of data that you know. And X, R, Y, R are, are really the things that you're after, right? So you really the goal, right? The goal is to give x r y r right in terms of x y and what I mean that makes sense. You would like the formula to depend on the vector that you started with. That's reasonable. And what else could the formula depend on? What else would be reasonable? For the formula to depend on. Yeah, because like I mean, uh, it kind of is a given that you have to tell me by how, what amount you want to rotate, right? Depending on how much you wanted to rotate a vector, you would expect different answers. So. A, a, a satisfactory formula would be one where x, r, and y, r are given in terms of x, y, and theta. Is that making sense? Because that's kind of like what seems to be what you need in order to specify the rotation. Like you have to tell me by how much you want to rotate, and you also should tell me what vector, what thing you're rotating, right? 
Okay. So uh, now what's useful, is that, is that making sense so far so good? Uh, now the, the formula is actually very cool to find. It's an, a nice application of basic trigonometry. So let me, let's try to find the formula here. Uh, in order to find the formula, it's convenient to, to like kind of introduce some auxiliary variables, but like you'll see that they get used, um, you know, they will get, we will get rid of them at the end of the problem. Okay, so what's, um, what's an auxiliary var variable that I want to use? I'm going to use R. So R is going to be the length of the vector of the vector V. And uh, I'm going to use also an, uh, an auxiliary variable, which is going to be, um, just to call it something, I'm going to call it alpha. And that's just going to be the, or the angle between V and the X axis. So let me, in fact, I'll put them in blue just to, Emphasize that they are like um, there are new variables, like or auxiliary ones. And so alpha is going to be the angle between V. and the x-axis. Okay, is that making sense? Okay, and why is that useful? Because uh, typically there's a right triangle in the picture, right? Which I see here. So let me try to draw it separately from for you. So you have you have something like this, right? Uh, you have R, you have this angle alpha, and then we can complete this picture. Um, so what is the vertical side of this triangle? What is this side? Well, that's just Y, right? And what's the horizontal side? That's just X, right? That's kind of like uh, how these conventions work for the X and Y coordinates, right? And so, uh, basic, it is convenient to have some sort of like um, uh, trig identities on, on our hand. So, uh, what was, uh, what is the sign of alpha in this picture? What would be the sign of alpha? So the sign was the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse, right? So the sign would be y over r, and the cosine would be x over r, right? That's like the sine and cosine in terms of like of the sides of a right triangle. Is that is that okay? Now, uh, that is more convenient to write it. I'm going to write it like if you multiply both sides of the equation by R, right? You get something that's a little bit more useful for us, which would be that X is R cosine of alpha and uh, Y is R sine of alpha.
This is actually, I mean, if you have taken um, calculus two, not that you have to, but if you ever took calculus two, this is what's called polar coordinates, right? Um, I don't know how many of you have seen this, but it is essentially uh, what you would see like in a formula for polar coordinates. Uh, for those who have seen calc, calc two before. Okay, now uh, notice that there's a similar diagram I can draw for the other vector, for the red one. So let's do this for the red one. This is where things get a little bit more interesting. So for 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 the per, uh, for the purple one, the angle was alpha, right? Now, what should be the angle between the red vector? and the x-axis, what would you put as the angle? It's alpha plus theta, yeah, correct. Because theta is just uh, what's the angle of rotation, but the total angle starts from the x-axis, so you have to take into account the the, the 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 starting angle. So the total angle is actually alpha plus theta. Is that is that okay? Is that, is that making sense? Now uh, the vertical entry is called um, y sub r, right? The horizontal entry of this triangle is called x sub r. That's kind of by, by how we define things. And here's another important thing to notice, right? Which is what should be the length of this hypotenuse, right? So it, again, just to go back to the original picture, what we're doing here is taking this vector and rotating it to this new vector, right? So when you, um, when you rotate a vector, right, like as you see here, here I'm rotating a vector. What happens with the length of a vector when you rotate it? So what, what, if you have a vector and you rotate it by an angle, what's the length, how are the, how, what happens with the length? It stays the same, good, yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's the idea. Good, that's an important fact. So this is important. A rotation does not change the length of a vector. Good. Uh, rotating a vector doesn't change its length. Okay, perfect. And so that's a nice, that, that's a cool thing because basically then we can use the same formula, um, but keeping R because R is the same and using the new angle. So we can say that um, X sub R is R because the R is the same cosine of not alpha, but cosine of theta plus alpha, because now the angle is, um, or theta, alpha plus theta. And then um, we can also say that y sub r is r sine of theta plus alpha. 
So you see, like it is essentially the the analog of the previous two formulas, but for the new angles and new variables. Is that making sense? And we're done, it's just that now we just have to work out a little bit the formula. So let's begin with XR. Let's start with XR. So XR is R cosine of alpha plus theta. And this is one of those place times, a uh, few times, or I don't know, where it's actually kind of useful to remember the formula for the cosine of the sum of two angles. So there's like this formula that is that the cosine of two angle of the sum of two angles is the cosine cosine, so it's cosine of alpha cosine of theta minus sine of alpha sine of theta. Okay, so it's like a formula that you make, I mean, it's easy to forget, but now it is actually a formula that's quite convenient, okay? So this becomes R cosine of alpha cosine of theta minus R sine of alpha sine of theta. Is that making sense so far so good? But what is R cosine of alpha? Anyone remember? Um, well, uh, is it, well, it depends um, where, um, well, is this, uh, is this formula okay? How is this formula obtained? Well, it's just that if you look at this triangle, if you look at this triangle, the cosine of alpha plus theta, the cosine is the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. Um, is that making sense? And then you just multiply both R sides of the equation by R, and that's how you get uh, to this one. Oops. Um, well, I'm not sure uh, what this and uh, the six uh, refers to on the chat. Um, if you once you get to this formula. To go from this one to this one, you have to apply the the formula for the cosine of the sum of two angles. So you get to this, and then you just distribute the R, so you get to this. Um, but then, um, uh, what is R cosine of alpha? based on what we had written before. Oh, it's just, oh, because alpha is your region, alpha is the angle that I'm calling between V. Alpha was the angle that V was making with the X axis. And this vector is being rotated by an angle of theta, right? So I'm just trying to find what's the new angle between the new vector and the X axis. And you see like they just add up. Like, you know, if, like if this vector is making an angle of 10 degrees and then you rotate it by 20 degrees, the new vector is making an angle of 30 degrees with respect to the X axis. Right, right.
Is that making sense? Uh, now, and then now when you see R cosine of alpha, where did we write R cosine of alpha before? It's here, right? So R cosine of alpha is X. And where did we write R sine of alpha before? It's here, that's why. And this is the formula that we were after. Like it's, so, it's an important formula. So let me just write it again, like in, call, in a box, because this is giving you like a formula for X of R in terms of X, Y, and the cosine. So you see, this is what we were after because it's giving you a formula of the new entry of the vector in terms of x, y, and the angle. And in fact, like it is correct, but like it's better if we'll see more, more convenient to, to switch around the order. So I'll put cosine of theta x and then sine of theta y. So it's the same as this one. I just uh, changed the order in which these two factors appear. Is that making sense? And then you do the same for the other one. So what is the formula for Y? It's R sine of alpha plus theta. And then you use the formula for the, the sine of the sum of two angles. Uh, okay, let me put it, you can do it this way actually. Okay, but the, now it's kind of similar. R cosine of the R cosine of alpha is x, so you get y sub r equals x sine of theta. Okay, and then R sine of alpha is y. And so you get plus y cosine of theta. Okay. And so you get to this. Again, it's such an important formula that I'll put it in, uh, in colors uh, in a box. I'll put it as sine of theta x plus cosine of theta y. Uh, is that okay? Is that making sense so far so good?
So just to summarize, so um, what's going on here, what I'm saying is that if you had started with a vector that is x, y, and you rotate it by an angle of theta, right? If you rotate it by an angle of theta, then um, the entries of this new vector are the x co uh, cosine of theta x minus sine of theta y and um, sine of theta x plus cosine of theta y. And it's actually um, before maybe before proceeding, let let me show you this like how it looks on an animation. That can be useful to see, I think. So let's start with that. I'll start with uh, my favorite vector here, zero, and then. Let's see, oh, this is one going to be one comma two. Uh, let's, or let's make it two comma one actually. Okay, so I'll put on GeoGebra, you can put a vector like this. Okay, let's call this vector V. Okay, this is a, so this would be like a vector Um, like the one we have been considering. We don't no longer need to see this. Uh, well, I'll make sure actually. Okay, and now I'm going to introduce, um, let's call it theta t. Okay. okay, so I'm going to introduce something that's, uh, okay. Uh, So if you look at those formulas, x is two. I don't know if you can check if you can see me writing writing it here. So and y is one, so it's like this, and then sine of two sine of t cosine. Okay. So this is going to be the rotated vector. Yeah, this should be fine. Okay, so let's see. So, so I, I entered the, I created this vector using the formula for the rotation. And this is the angle of rotation. So when the angle of rotation is zero, the vectors are aligned. Right, and then I start increasing the angle of rotation. And you see like on the animation, you can see what the angle of rotation that I'm choosing. And this, act, this formula works actually for any angle. So it doesn't have to be less than 90 degrees. So you, you can see it keeps working. until you get to 360 when, and then you're back to where you started. You see, so that gives you like a way to rotate like the, the starting vector into the new vector that you want. Is that making sense? So you can see it does have the same length as the original one. Okay.
So just to write it, it is useful to write this down, um, kind of like one, one equation after the other. So the first equation is like this, is this one. This was the first equation we found. And the second equation we found is this one. Okay, so what makes this uh, this more interesting, again, this was an operation that we did on the vector. We took the vector and rotated it. If you look, what makes this uh, more interesting than what we were doing before is that this is like an operation that combines the two entries of the vector, right? So this is uh, because before when we were multiplying a vector by a number, each entry just got multiplied by that number. And when we were adding vectors like you would add the first entries together and then the second entries together. So in a sense, like the first entry never saw the second entry, but this is like a, a formula, right? These two formulas come mix together the entries of X, uh, the two entries of the vector. Okay. Um, and so what ends up being useful, um, so let me say that, write that down first. These two equations or these two formulas, Combine, uh, uh, involve the two entries of the vector at the same time. At the same time. So that's nice. And then uh, comes like the real uh, new part, which is like, Okay, these are like the two equations and that's fine. We just want like a better way to memorize the equation, right? So we want a better way to understand the equations. Okay, so like we are now looking for a better way to understand these equations. Okay. And the idea is like, well, um, each vector, right? Each vector had two entries, X and Y. And there, it produced a new vector, which had two entries, X, R and Y, R, right? So if you see, uh, if you see uh, here, there are like four numbers, cosine, minus sine, sine, and cosine, right? And so what we're going to do is just kind of store these four numbers in a, an array, uh, four is two by two. So we're going to store it in a two by two array. And that's what we're going to call a matrix. Okay, so these four numbers, we're just going to record them as an array. So uh, what, we, like, what we're going to learn how to do in this course is to like, you know, from an equation like this, from an equation like this, how to re re rewrite that or how to understand that as these two equations. Okay, but it will become like, um, like a useful way to remind, remember the equations to write it in a version like this. And this is what's going to be called a, a matrix basically. This is actually what's going to be called a two by two matrix. This will be called a two by two matrix. Is that making sense? So a matrix uh, here is just like appearing as a way to kind of like, um, you know, connect the different entries of a vector to connect the entries of two different vectors. Okay, so here, um, the matrix, here a matrix is a way to connect, to relate the entries of two vectors.
Professor, I have a question. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, sure. uh, yeah, for um, cosine uh, theta, like mm -hmm. minus sine, sine theta, I understand, but at the bottoms are a y are equal to the sine theta, supposed to be plus cosine theta y, right? I just confused like this part. Oh, right, right. It's just like, um, I, I'm going to, uh, okay, right, right. So how am I, uh, uh, what's, um, like the idea, and I'm actually going to explain this again from scratch, but like the idea is like, if you look at the first equation, right? What I'm yeah. looking, what, what I'm copying is like the, the numbers or the coefficients multiplying each variable at, at yes. the first row. So that's why I got cosine of theta and minus yeah. sine of theta, right? Mm -hmm. But for the second equation or the second row, um, what I was multiplying x is just sine, which is why I put it here. But uh, the thing that was multiplying y was plus cosine. Uh, so that's why, um, I don't know if that was your question of why I'm putting here cosine of theta, um, because that's what's multiplying the variable y in the second equation. So um, my question is like uh, for here, it's mm -hmm. supposed to be sine plus cosine. Because because the equation of uh, y r equals uh -huh. to sine, right? Mm, sine x. But, uh -huh. but I just didn't see like the plus in the. Oh, oh, oh right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this it's is It's supposed the plus, to be have it, right? It's supposed to be what? Sorry. I mean, um. It was supposed uh, right. It's supposed to. It's supposed to be minus in the first row in the first equation and with the plus in the second one. Yes. Yeah, but in uh, that, the but in the box I didn't see that, you know. Oh, okay, I get you, I get you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, so oh, I just wanna. Right, right. Yes. Uh, the box. This box, you mean? Or. I mean, the, yeah. let me see the which one is. Could you down? Could you go down? Uh -huh. Down. Okay, this one. Y yes. Oh, right, right. Uh, no, in this. Uh, oh, oh, okay, I get you. Um, you can. Uh, sorry, um, I, I now you could have put a plus here. If that's what you're asking. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. No, I got, I got, I get it now. Uh, that's fine. Usually, when there's a plus, if there's nothing, it's implicit that it's a plus in a sense. You know what I mean? Uh, okay. It's kind of like in the same way in which people would write negative two but not plus two. Like almost no one writes plus two, right? But people okay. will write. Uh, so it's yeah. No, I get it. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. It would have been fine to put plus two uh, or sorry, plus cosine. It's just kind of like an overkill just because whenever like the thing comes with a plus, it's implicit. But I'm actually going to go, give like a formula in a second that will clarify that. But yeah, like, no, thanks. Now I, I get it. So yeah, it is more like a okay. implicit, an implicit thing. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, because so, um, sometimes make me confuse like uh, right, right. science with a multiple, maybe multiple cosine because it looks like a multiple. Right, right. No, no, I get it. And now, uh, uh, so, and then for the other question, uh, yeah, well, uh, right. You could like, maybe we'll get that. Um, we can get to that like after, not today, but once we have talked more about like how these matrices work. Yeah. You could think of cosine of theta, cos of theta and sine of theta as, as its own matrix and this as its own matrix, but that's a little bit too much for what I want to be saying today because it's the first day. But that, yeah, there are other ways to think about um, or um, these, these things uh, which we'll get to, but for now I'm thinking about it as a single two by two thing, two by two quantity, but yeah, there are other ways to break it down uh, later on. Um, so, um, but yeah, you could like reinterpret it as as uh, two pieces, like two columns, and that's like two, 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 two mini mini matrices, for example. Uh, but yeah, just to maybe clarify this, like what I mean, like so that. Uh, so let me um, tell you more about matrices in the remaining minutes that we have. Maybe I'll talk about this for that just ten more minutes. I usually don't want to, like you know, talk for two hours because that's just too much. Um, so I don't. We'll try not to. And the class, like you know, uh, uh, like at ten p ten exactly, but just like just like as a preview of tomorrow. So here's like a preview of what we will do tomorrow. So what what 
what are you, what are we going to think about as a matrix? So this is what is going. This is what a matrix is going to be for us. This is going to be called, like for example, a two by two matrix. Okay, and this is what will appear. Uh, like actually, I'll give this two different colors. Okay, and this is what uh, will appear when you have a vector x, y, and want to produce a new vector. Uh, let's call this new vector, uh, uh, let's call it uh, x prime, y prime. The primes here have nothing to do with derivative, just so that there's no confusion. Okay. But it's just like a new name for um, for for the new vector. So the idea is like I had I start with a vector uh, x y. And I want to get to a new vector, x prime, y prime. Maybe, and this one could be even bigger, right? And if I want to connect them somehow via using a matrix, uh, like the formula is like the following. So the idea is that So if you somehow wanted to connect these two vectors with the matrix, the idea is like the new entry, the new entries are given in terms of the old, older entries as follows. So you get A, B, D, D. Okay, so. So this is the new vector. In terms of the old vector and the matrix. So like the the the, the entries of the matrix are literally the numbers that appear in front of x and y. Okay, so the entries of the numbers in the matrix are just like the coefficients that you will see in, in front of X and Y. So let's make this even more concrete because like at this point it could still be too abstract. So imagine, right? And I'll finish with that today and tomorrow we'll, we'll start um, doing this again. But imagine that I had started like, I start with the vector X, Y and I want to produce um, a new vector and what is this new vector going to be? Well, it's going to be very easy. It's just going to be uh, the first entry of this new vector is going to be the, the difference between the entries of the original vector. So it's going to be X minus Y. And the second entry of the new vector is going to be like the sum of the entries of the original vector. So it's going to be X plus Y. So like, for example, just to make this more concrete, uh, if this vector had been two, one, right? What would be the new, what would be the entries of the new vector in terms of this formula? So the first entry is supposed to subtract these two entries. So what should I put uh, first? It's right, like the first, like you first subtract, so you put two minus one, and then you put uh, two plus one, 
So that, that does give you the vector um, one, three, good, perfect. Okay, so this is like a way to get a new vector, right? Like you started with the vector and you just subtracted the entries and added them up. Okay, what I'm saying is that if you look at the equation, right? If you look at the equations, at the corresponding equations, this is saying that x prime is x minus y and uh, y prime is x plus y, okay? And the idea is that um, the numbers that appear in front of the variables are the entries of the matrix. So how can we make that more explicit? Because it may be a little bit hidden right now. Well, what, it, what are the entries? Uh, what are the entries that you see here? Well, what's multiplying x? The thing that's multiplying x is the number one. So you can write this as one x minus y minus one y, okay? And then you can write this as, uh, what's the co other color that you use? It would be one x plus one y, okay? So you see like actually secretly in this formula, we have the numbers one minus one, one minus uh, one and one. So what I'm saying is that the matrix corresponding to this operation is going to be for us, one, negative one, one, one. Is that making sense? So that's like what it was hidden. Uh, so if you, if I just gave you the matrix, like the idea is to get used to a problem where I just give you this matrix and you immediately would end up recognizing this as uh, saying that you started with the vector x, y and you produce a vector x minus y, x plus y. So just to write this down, so the idea is that this thing will produce Um, uh, one X minus one Y one X plus one Y. Okay, so again, we'll think about the matrix uh, starting tomorrow as, as, as kind of like this conversion process. And you start with a vec with an old vector and produce a new vector. And to do that, you will use a matrix. Okay, so again, like I'll repeat uh, some of this stuff um, next time tomorrow when I give you the formula again. But it's just like a way to start building up uh, some ideas on what Uh, no, uh, well, I mean, this thing about eigenvectors will be uh, until the very end of the course, but no, this is not an eigenvector because an eigenvector is supposed to stay on the same direction as the original vector and the rotation always changes that the direction. So it cannot be, a, actually the rotation matrix does not have eigenvectors if you only use um, real eigenvalues. But that's like a more advanced uh, thing. We'll do that at the end of the, towards the end of the course. Um, but yeah, for now, it's more like to think about, you have a vector, you want to get to a new vector. So to go from old to new, we will connect these two vectors via a matrix. So we'll think about matrices as ways to connect vectors together. So what I'll tell you tomorrow is a, a little bit about, about matrices, how to get used to them, how to like kind of recognize this and do it more mechanically. But this is really what makes like linear algebra interesting because it's giving you like ways to relate vectors, which are not just like by adding them together or like multiplying them by a number. It's like a genuinely different way to, to do things. So it will be, it is a nice thing to, to do and we'll get used to that uh, uh, next time tomorrow. So yeah, I'll upload the video in a couple of minutes. Um, as I said, I'll just end the Zoom meeting, but I will reopen it like 
like in 10 minutes, in case someone wants to ask me something for office hours, I just want to save the video first to my computer, just in case it breaks down. So, but yeah, uh, otherwise I'll see you tomorrow, if that sounds good.